you know, sometimes you, you ask yourself, you know, how difficult can it be to understand that nature has been taking care of itself for millions of years. Mm. And us humans, we've only been here a little fraction of that time. And mm. in this part of the world, I mean, where I'm sitting, there was uh, two kilometers of ice on top of this until 10,000 years ago. So we've been here for 10,000 years, but nature has been around very much longer. Nature knows how to take care of itself. It's only when we screw up the systems, that's when nature gets a bit confused. But as soon as you let nature, you, you know, you let nature take a hand, uh, you, you give them a finger, um, you give it a finger, or you give it an opportunity, then nature comes back. If, if there's just, you know, if, if there's just the, some of the basic building stones, like an ecosystem that is reasonably, uh, uh, you know, rewildable it would become wild again mm. and if the animals are very few uh, they will multiply un unless we uh, we take them out mm. and uh, if the um, animals are missing the only thing we need the only management we really need to do is to put them back mm. so i'm greatly in favor of putting back all the species that we lost since the ice age uh, in europe in all the different countries so th that is a that is a matter of respecting ourselves, respecting our natural heritage. This is, these are the animals and the beings, and it's not only animals, it's, you know, it's birds and plants and bees and, you know, the whole program. These are what we have grown up as a species in this part of the world together with. These are parts of our legends and stories and history, and it's part of our, they've been part of our daily economy. They've, they've been what we've been eating and sometimes I get very frustrated about this. Yeah, well, I, I get frustrated about a couple of things, but one of them is that we think we can disconnect from nature, like nature is something over there and we are here, and that we can do things uh, with nature without affecting ourselves. That's ridiculous. I mean, we are part of it. And if we try to master it, nature, nature will bite us back. If we, if we, if we, stupidly believe that that uh, nature is here for us and not us here as a part of it then we're on the wrong track and and that will it has been proven over and over and over again and it will be proven over and over again as soon as you do things against the force of nature then you know things will go bad for example, in Sweden, we now have bark beetle infestations. Mm. Yeah, uh, so the, the commercial forestry is really, they're really upset and really, now they want to chop down lots of trees in nature reserves because um, they are infested by bark beetles. Uh, but honestly, it's just because they want to cut down trees that they can't get at otherwise. Because why are there bark beetles now? Well, there's always been bark beetles. It's, they are part of nature, but they become very many when you take down the natural forest and yeah. replace it with plantations. Okay. Suddenly, if you're, if you're a, imagine you are a spruce eating bug and suddenly the humans plant spruces all of the same age, all of the same species by the millions in straight lines and square checkered patterns. Then that would be hallelujah for the bark beetle. Of course, the bark beetle has multiplied in those plantations. And now the industry is complaining that the forests that are not yet plantations, not yet been annihilated and made plantations, now they want to make and uh, cut the trees there. Mm. Uh, and, and they blame the bark beetle. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a fundamental lack of understanding that eco ecology is about relationships it, and interconnectedness and mutual dependence and also that all the species work together some they're going to they're going to in suppression of when something is going to get out of control then the natural community has the ability to come back, bring it back into a dynamic order that order is never static but it depends on on the membership of all the community. And I think our lack of understanding that ecology is about community, including the human community. For me, that is really a, a core absence in our education. And it's yeah, a core we, absence. We did, 
I agree. We did this project that we called the Big Five, the Scandinavian yes. Big Five. So Fair it was enough. about the big five carnivores in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. The wolf, the bear, the lynx, the wolverine, and of course the most common and most dangerous of all the carnivores, the humans. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we put the humans in as one of the big five carnivores in, in the Nordic countries and the Scandinavia. So that was so funny. It, it raised a lot of eyebrows. But uh, first, when you realize that our species is carnivorous, then we realize why we sometimes have a problem with other carnivorous species. Mm. We tend to see them as competitors yes. and, uh, and then have all kinds of explanations, you know, mm. why, you know, that is a logic uh, mm. attitude or not. Mm. But uh, yeah. yeah, but we, we are part of nature. We're part of nature, we're part of the larger community. And I, you know, I had a conversation with a sperm whale scientist not long ago, a man who, you know, studies sperm whale cultures in the oceans, who studies their languages, who studies their communities, and is very aware of how all their lives are really lived in, in these bonds with each other, and, they're, and obviously the bonds with the life of the sea. And this is their culture, you know. And... I asked him what he thought was the single most important thing that people needed to understand at this very, very critical point where we're at. And he said, what we desperately need is a larger sense of community. And to know that our community is the entire planet and all its beings. And, and with that shift, then you, become, you can begin to come into more ecological relationships where there's a recognition of interdependence. Yeah. Yeah, yes. sometimes uh, we're talking about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's quite a horrible word because it's very academic, mm. very intellectual. It's bio, which is Latin, diversity, which is also Latin. And um, it's not people's everyday language. So you tend to think when you hear biodiversity, if you're not an ecologist or biologist or administrator of, of those kind of things, then you think, yeah, you know, biodiversity, bio this or bio that. I mean, it's not a big deal. We can be without it. But what it means is life around us. The community of life. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 this is the life on our planet. Life. I mean, how, <laughs> sometimes you think, how difficult should that be to understand? <laughs> if we take I, out all life, I mean, that's what we've been, look at your daily food. Uh, most people, we eat life. And if, and, and if we screw up that life, then what should we be eating? <laughs> as easy as that. I think, you know, we, we ask ourselves the same question. Um, how difficult can this be? That's why to me the rewilding concept is very powerful because it means there's exactly. hope, exactly. there's a chance, and exactly. there's something actively that we can do. Exactly. <clears throat> and let the waters flow and mm -hmm. let the forests grow. Yes let the animals roam beautiful yeah. absolutely yeah. exactly yeah. and then we ourselves are uplifted <clears throat> by that so stuff and i'm going to screen share this is the wonderful coast of croatia part of rewilding europe yeah yeah this is an amazing area it, it probably has the highest density of bears than uh, in all of europe that's I, I remember i remember one evening i saw 14 different bears there uh, just half an hour's drive up from the, the, the very busy uh, beach tourism coastline. That's fantastic. Absolutely. How wonderful. And the rewilding yeah. area extends from the coast up into the mountains, I believe. Yeah, exactly. All the way up. And they're trying, they're, they're trying a couple of different things. And one of them was to, um, to, um, to buy a hunting um, area to to buy the hunting rights or to lease the hunting rights for a 10-year period the big 17,000 hectare uh, mm -hmm. hunting ground and to, to not hunt mm -hmm. so to solve it in, in the classic way you buy the hunting rights but you decide not to hunt because mm -hmm. you own the hunting rights so you can do what you like mm -hmm. and uh, then of course that that was a new new way of doing things and I thought that was quite intelligent and it was supported by the main owners of the other hunting grounds 
around it because anyone can realize, and all of them realize that if we don't hunt in this zone, there will be many more animals in this zone. And sooner or later, those animals will spill, o- spill over into the other zones. And then they will have more to hunt. <laughs> mm, exactly. <laughs> and that's actually how a lot of nature reserves work. Mm-hmm. You know, you protect a core production area. Yes. For example, a, a fish production ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, so nobody can fish there. And then nobody needs to be nervous that mm-hmm. the next door guy will go there and fish instead. If I don't, he will or she yeah. will. Yeah. So then you can all relax and nobody goes there to fish. But everyone will be fishing very close to the border of that protection zone. And it shows out in those cases this has been tried. They make much more money. They f- catch much more fish than they did before. And wonderful. And that, that's then the self-sustaining powers of the natural world are being, we're engaging with that. And here we have a wonderful photo of Lapland. Um, part of the Rewilding Europe network now, uh, recently, yeah. I believe. Yeah, it's a, a couple of years ago, and uh, they're still, you know, working on what exactly to to be doing up here. This is one of the wilder parts of uh, of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you look at Europe outside Russia. This is uh, one of the wildest areas. Oh, it's fabulous. Uh, but yeah. uh, so, if, if you look at wildness on a one to ten scale. This is maybe an eight or a nine, Mm -hmm. but there's still quite a few things that that could be done uh, or or stopped to be done uh, in order to let this place become a a 10 of a 10 grade scale. Mm, What are they? One of them is letting animals back. Another one is is, uh, letting fish migrate up the rivers take away the obstacles or, and, and recreate, help recreate the, um, the river banks and the rivers that were ruined by man at one point when uh, floating timber down these rivers. Okay. Now that the timber floating has stopped, mm-hmm. then we can restore the rivers and the, the salmon, the salmonid fish could come back, which they do, of course, as soon as they get the chance. Yes, they've been, they've been, there has been you know, Alaska amounts of fish in these rivers once upon a time. Mm. That was some, you know, 100 years ago or something. Mm. You had this tremendous abundance and, and all that abundance it will return when we allow it. And when we allow it, if we, if we pull the brakes in time, that, that's mm. crucially important because you can also reach a tipping point like has been done with cod resources, for example, in Nam- some of the richest cod fishing waters in the world, mm-hmm. uh, the cod disappeared 20 years ago and they still haven't come back because they were fished almost down to the last single fish. Mm-hmm. So that's the, 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 the bravery is to pull the brakes in time. Absolutely. And here we have, uh, these are, I believe, Sami people. Yeah, this is a, this is a nature tourism um, product actually I, I was there to to tell the story about um, reindeer sledding in the Laponia World Heritage Area mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the guy here is a Sami reindeer owner who uh, who runs the trip mm-hmm. so we were walking and sledding mm-hmm. uh, in a it, it's like a long train of reindeer mm-hmm. so they are trained of course they are they are domesticated Mm-hmm. These ones more than their than their brothers and sisters up in the mountains because the rest of the reindeer they run a reasonably free life, but mm-hmm. each one of them is owned by somebody, so they are livestock. Mm-hmm. But it's a very wild way of of having li- livestock, mm-hmm. and uh, like many other, I mean, the, the reindeer they belong to here. Yes, they've been here for, since the ice age, mm-hmm. and uh, they the, the the domesticated ones or the owned once they do the same job as mm-hmm. the wild ones once did they eat in one end they poop in the other end and they trample in the middle and when they some of them when they die they provide food for a, a whole bunch of other species mm. species so involved they're moving freely through the landscape which is of course the, that's their ecological role yeah it, it, that has been cut a bit though by uh, 
electro uh, hydroelectric power stations by huge clear cuttings etc so many reindeer nowadays need to be transported by lorry between their summering grounds in the mountains and the wintering grounds in the forest okay here's a european bison what a magnificent beautiful creature yeah yeah this is our uh, our biggest still alive land mammal in our continent mm. and to tease the Americans a bit, it's actually that they're actually they actually grow bigger than the American bison. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is this is one of our continent's um, main herbivore uh, heritage. The, 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 they've been in almost all countries in Europe. Sweden had a bison. We killed them and ate them thousands of years ago. Britain had the, uh, the, the fields between Britain and France, which were the dogger banks. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were at one point in time in, during glaciation, they were not, that was not water, that was land, grazing mm -hmm. land. Okay. So aurochs, aurochs and wild horses and bison and red deer were roaming by the millions. Mm -hmm. Think the best scenes you've seen from the Serengeti those yeah. were the numbers these, these mammals had in, in a number of places across Europe. That is fantastic. That's such a beautiful image. I didn't realize that at all. That is, that is wonderful. And this species almost disappeared. It was, there were six of them left in, in breeding, six mm -hmm. individuals. So now there are 5,000 and all those 5,000 come from the, the genetic base of these six. So that was a last minute uh, solution. They, they, they pulled the brakes just in just time. In time, yes, just in. And can you, they've been, they've been reintroduced now uh, in the Carpathians? Uh, yes, that was, that was a fantastic experience. After 200 years of, of not being present there, mm -hmm. we uh, actually brought them back. Mm. And now Rewilding Europe has brought uh, I think a couple of hundred bison, all in all, mm. to uh, to the southern Carpathians, and they are now living freely, making babies, eating the bush, doing mm. exactly what they they are supposed to be doing. Mm. And it was it, there it was easier uh, in Romania. They disappeared two hundred years ago. It means that they're almost still in popular memory. Mm. Uh, where we reduced them, the the, the 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 place names were like Bison Hill, Bison Bog, Bison Lake, Bison River, mm. Bison Mountain, etc. So it it they fit immediately. And mm. local people that I spoke to, they said, "Ah, oh, it's so nice to have them back." That's like right. you know an old relative that you haven't seen yeah. for a long time, and suddenly you see them again. Whereas in Sweden, they disappeared more than seven thousand years ago. So mm. here. They, they're like from another planet. They, they feel alien mm -hmm. to many people. Mm. So it, for them, it's an exotic species, but mm. they have the full right to be here just as any other of the species that we exterminated mm. since, since the Ice Age. And this is a rewilding of our, our culture, you know, our sense, of, um, our, our sense of the landscape, which has been uh, impoverished, so impoverished, as you've you know, say in Sweden, there we're looking at thousands of years of absence, and yet there in Romania, um, they were kept within the collective memory, and so they could be accepted back again so easily. Um, it's it's really such a beautiful story, and what amazing creatures they are. And here we have another absolutely. I love this image because what I see in this beautiful, you know, rewilded horse is what I see on the walls of the caves all over Europe when our ancestors you know painted these beautiful prehistoric horses and they observed them so closely and they brought them to life on the cave walls and here I am looking you know thousands of years later at a living yeah. horse. And they look exactly the same yeah. and this is actually an Exmoor pony uh -huh. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> which has been kept apart from other horses for more than a thousand years. Yes. And they are very close to what the original wild horse, the, the, the Northwest European original wild horse mm. 
mm. once looked like. It shows that the European horses, there were maybe five different uh, kinds of them already from old age. So their DNA is very different. Okay. So there was a Northwest European horse, uh -huh. there was a Southern European horse, there was a Balkan mm -hmm. horse or even two, and there was a Northeast European horse. So, so they were, and there, there was the steppe horse, the, the big mm -hmm. the horse of the Russian, Ukrainian, Kazakh uh, mm -hmm. and Chinese steps. Yeah, so but this looks very much like the, the cave paintings and one of the things that's, that's interesting with these horses is that they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Like wild animals, you know, they all look mm -hmm. the same. If, if mm -hmm. humans don't fiddle with them, then wild animals look the same. Mm -hmm. These zebras, they're all striped, they're not checkered some of them or, or spotted yeah. or something. Yes, uh, yeah. they all they all look the same although there are variations in the stripes they still mm. look you know mm. Uh, mm. united or you unified somehow mm. there is a coherence um I, when we last spoke um you know we, we spoke about the relationship between the 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 rewilded horses or in cases like these where they've been kept very separate from domestic domestic horses and how rapidly they adapt to living with predators again. I mean, you told me, gave me an example of, um, I think where horses were reintroduced and within a, a couple of years, they were already defending themselves very effectively against wolves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's amazing. You can take domesticated animals and you put them under wild conditions where they need to fend for themselves. There's no, um, no, uh, no fences, there's no, uh, how would say, no veterinary, there's no, yeah, the, 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 all the natural conditions are there and they just need to do their own, the good old job that they've been doing since mm. the dawn of ages. Mm. And very quickly they adapt. Mm. And horses are no ex ex exemption. It, it's, I mean, the cow and the horse, could we, could we imagine any more domestic kind of animals than that? And mm. it, it's a big step for many people to, to take mentally or mm. thinking wise, mm. to look at a cow and a horse and think that, yeah, these are wild animals. Mm. No, come on, they're domestic. I mean, they're the definition of domestic is mm. that the horse and the cow, you it can't get more domestic than that. Mm. Yet you put these same horses in the wild, expose them for, for the wild conditions, and they adapt wonderfully. Hmm. Same thing with goats and, the, and, and pigs. So the, the funny thing is that many of our domesticated animals, if you put them in nature and just let them go, you know, 10, 20 generations later, they look like the wild originals. They lost the white color or the, uh, they lost the domestic traits. You, you, you release goats on a, a remote Greek island somewhere, you know, normal domestic goats. Well, 20, 30 generations or something later, they all look like the wild original goat. Mm, fantastic. Quite funny. Yeah. And sheep, same yeah. thing. It really is. And, you know, the, you know, the behavior, I mean, I had a personal experience of actually being on a, on a trained, you know, American Mustang um, among wild horses in the, nor uh, the Northern Rockies, the Canadian Rockies. And I was able to see the, um, the behavior of the wild stallion bands towards us was quite remarkable because my guide was riding a mare and she'd already told me, she said, I have absolutely no worries about riding my mare among these wild stallion bands because in their societies, they are disciplined to respect the females. And we had the wild stallions actually approach us, you know, at a canter which is very, very impressive when you see six wild stallions actually cantering towards you. And they didn't approach, they, they stopped at about 15 meters away and then they just circled us. There was a sense of space that they didn't break. And I thought that was really remarkable because if you look at domestic horses who are um, out of that um, social relationship that you get among the wild groups they would be right in there barging around so the behavior that they had returned to that those natural social relationships as well as dealing with predators very effectively yeah yeah so 
this is another uh, story of a remarkable comeback. Yeah, the white-tailed eagle or the sea eagle. Mm -hmm. it, um, it was persecuted for ages. It was, of course, uh, exterminated completely from the British Isles mm -hmm. and most of, of Central Europe and uh, pretty much only survived in parts of Eastern Europe and uh, Russia and, and Scandinavia. And when I started becoming a bird watcher at age of 13, we had some 40 pairs left in Sweden. And mm. that year they, they all together produced one chick. Mm. 40 pairs produced one chick. Mm. So the, the story was almost over. I, I, when I saw my first sea eagle, I, I thought, what, how lucky am I to have seen one at least? I can tell my grandchildren that there once upon a time were sea eagles. Mm. And then things changed. We, we uh, stopped persecuting them, or at least slowed down that process a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, pulled out a few of the most vicious uh, chemicals, PCB, DDT, mm. methylated, uh, uh, yeah, what's it called? Quicksilver. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, suddenly, you know, surprise, surprise, they came back. When we stopped shooting them and poisoning mm -hmm. them, they suddenly actually knew how to survive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they made babies, and now in Sweden, from 40 pairs, we're up to, yeah, I think it's about 800 something, we almost lost count. And there are, there are thousands of eagles around and, and they are now having um, almost two chicks per pair instead of one chick on, in 40 pairs. So, and uh, you know, Germany has 700 pairs of sea eagles. That's Holland has, or the Netherlands have, have their first pair and Denmark mm. has sea eagles. Mm. And we even donated a few sea eagles from Scandinavia to to Scotland, and now that now they breed in Scotland, and I think next step was was Ireland, if the first ones have just arrived. They, so uh, they have indeed, yes, they yeah. have indeed. And it'll take another couple of decades before the worst prejudice has gone away, but it it, mm. it will, and people will find an immense pride in these eagles. Mm. Yes like I, people have done in other in, in all other areas where they come, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a receipt that <clears throat> nature conservation actually works. And, you know, I, I feel it's just so important to, to know that, um, you know, we find ourselves, you know, having to deal with so much of, and it's very important to have it, but the, the negative trends globally and um, and I feel that to that to be able to know just how powerful the, the resilience is 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 important so that we can keep we can keep doing this work. Yeah. And and here is a creature that I've never been I've never seen but has always fascinated me. And yeah. uh, this is a musk ox. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people mix them up the European bison and the aurox and the muskox are three different species living in different parts of, of, of our continent and having different preferences habitat wise etc mm. but this is again one of the species that belong to our natural heritage mm. it's the it's a it's an animal of, of the tundra and the high mountain tundra or the the arctic tundra and uh, humans managed to exterminate them completely all across Europe and all across, even across Siberia. They, they survived in Arctic Canada, in those islands where there were the least number of people and on Northeast Greenland where there's almost nobody. Mm. You know, the, the, the people pressure is extremely low in those places because mm. these are super easy to hunt. You can pretty much walk up to them and throw a spear if you dare, mm. or you can trap them and kill them. And, um, uh, as soon as firearms came into the picture, they, they disappeared over huge areas where they used to be before. Mm -hmm. It's like a bit, little bit like hunting a, I'll say a Volkswagen minibus on a parking lot. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. technically very difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. But now it's been reintroduced from Greenland to Norway, uh -huh. and there are some of them have been walking into Sweden and from Canada. They were being reintroduced to the Siberian tundra in a number of places. Mm. 
-hmm. and they're increasing everywhere. And they were reintroduced from the Canadian high Arctic islands to the Canadian mainland Arctic tundra, where they were also gone. Now there's tens of thousands of them. And uh, I'm a strong proponent that we should bring more of them back into Sweden to, mm -hmm. and we, we should allow the Norwegian population to grow more than in a very limited few number of mountain areas. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is our heritage. These are our animals. These are, you know, they belong here and mm -hmm. uh, our relation to them needs to change. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Our relationship to them. Um, is and it enriches ourselves. I think the last time you know we spoke, um, you said that you know our sense of who we are is needs to come into our relationship with with the natural world, because this you know our our identity as humans is bound up with you know these. I mean, extraordinary. You know, I, I look at this photo and and I. And you know you really capture this 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 presence and you know the movement of the guard hairs and then the you know the gaze and um you and I, I can just looking at the photo you know I can feel absolutely fascinated and I think how much I would love to see this being in in the wild and you know and it, Sweden and Norway um, they're accessible for us you know we could go yeah. and wonder at this. Yeah, this is from Dovrefjell in Norway. I can strongly recommend people to go there. And I would recommend you to walk with a guide because the guides, they know these animals. Mm. And they know how to not provoke them. And they mm. also even know the individual, the different individuals. Mm. So that you, you keep your respectful distance and you can still yes. see them. Yes. Reasonably close. And, mm. uh, and there will be no problems for neither for the, for the animals nor for ourselves. And of course, here is one of um, one of the I think creatures that has been most closely bound up with um, actually human cultures. We can, uh, you know, I, as you know, I, I live in France, and there is a, a there is a cave called Chauvet where the yeah. images are over thirty five thousand years old, and inside that cave um, there is actually what looks to be. Um, we would call it an altar. It's a fallen stone uh, at the center of, uh, of, of this space. And on it is a cave bear skull. And cave bears are painted on the walls of Chauvet. And they spoke to the, to the imagination of these, uh, you know, our, our ancestors, because they go into um, this state of hibernation. And so they're, they're not, they're somewhere between life and death. And, and so, you know, the imagination of our ancestors, they, through the bear, they, they began to reimagine a relationship between, you know, falling asleep and then dying and then going into the earth and then this regeneration that comes in, in spring. And so the, the bear spoke to, without words, um, the bear spoke of these cycles of life and, and death and, and renewal. And I, I love this photo because, of course, the, when you see a bear stand up like that and look at you and stand on its, you know, on its legs with the soles on the ground, um, the resemblance to a human is quite striking. Yes, and uh, I've photographed uh, several bear hunting uh, occasions as well. Mm -hmm. And when you when you have shot when a bear has been shot. Mm -hmm. And you've taken off uh, the head and the skin, mm -hmm. and the paws, then they look extremely human-like. Mm -hmm. So many uh, indigenous peoples have, have stories about how bears are actually humans, uh, dead spirits from, from before, who mm -hmm. have taken a new shape and mm -hmm. uh, put fur on. Uh, mm. So they, they look eerily human-like mm. and they're very intelligent animals. And I think all cultures where bears have existed have uh, had a deep respect for bears. They're, they're mm. very intelligent, mm. uh, very, very individual as well. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, you get bears of all kinds, you know, nice ones, not so nice ones, ag more aggressive ones, more, more cute sweet ones some of them eat more uh, prey others may mainly eat uh, ants and grass and berries and uh, 
they're very individual and they could be sour, you know, it could be grumpy or they could be nice and happy and jumping around. Mm. So it, it's, it's, it's really, this picture is from Romania, from the Carpathians. Where there is a very uh, high density of, uh, of, of bears. And in fact, they interact quite regularly with people. And as far as I know, that is part of the culture. It's accepted. There's a knowledge of how to live with bears. That... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's amazing how people are, people who are afraid of bears are usually living in areas where there are no bears. Mm. But yeah. people who live where there have been bears all the time, they're mm. very rarely afraid of bears. They mm. just know those things are there. And very few people who live in areas where there are bears ever see bears mm. because bears tend to stay away from people mm. and they tend to be nocturnal mm. working during the night. Mm. And well, they have good reasons to 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 keep away from us. They have uh, they have very good reasons, sadly. Although I had a beautiful experience, I was in uh, the rewilding uh, Apennines area in in Italy, which um, is about three hours from Rome, and uh, which has um, a, a population of a particular type of brown bear, the Marskin brown bear, and um, small numbers of individuals. But when I arrived at the little um, hotel where I was staying with our students who were studying ecology in the park, um, the man who greeted us said, oh, I had a bear in my orchard yesterday. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, yeah, very nice bear. <laughs> and, then, and then he said the bear took a few apples and wandered off. He was, yeah. you know, he, that was, he, he was absolutely accepting of the presence of the bear. I, I interviewed this this Romanian lady I, who, uh, she was age old, I mean, I'm sure 80 plus. Mm. And uh, she um, had a problem, she said, with bears in her garden, because when the apple trees were, the apples were ripe on the trees, yeah. then the bears would come yeah. into her garden. And, um, and she said, well, I don't mind when they eat the fallen apples, but sometimes when they climb the trees to eat the apples, so to say, straight from the, from the branch, then they sometimes break branches in the trees, and I don't like that. She said, "Okay." Um, and but the worst thing with the bears was that they ruined my fence, the fence around the house. So you know, they, the bears want to get in, and then they climbed over the fence, and many of them were quite heavy, so they broke the fence. <laughs> so I, so I asked her, "So what did you do to solve that?" Well, I, I opened the gate instead, she said. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Thank you. That's really... And then, and then suddenly no problems. I love that. And that's she so would great. also, um, you know, shake down a few apples so that there are some apples, you know, those who were falling on the ground anyway, they, they were there for the bear so she, they wouldn't climb the trees. But mm -hmm. otherwise, she said, otherwise there's no problem. She, she was almost affectionate about the bears, but yeah. as long as they didn't ruin her fence. That's really a beautiful story. Thank you. I, I love that. And here we have, um, you know, I love this photo because of the gaze. You know, it's such a, it's a very potent experience to meet the gaze of a wolf. Yeah. And to meet that, uh, you know, in, that intense, they're, they're so attentive, so aware, and it brings you awake. You know, you, you wake up when I've been around wolves. I've had that feeling of being, you know, called into being, right, wake up, be more alive, you know. Um, but we have had a very troubled relationship as humans with, with this. With wolves, yeah. Wolves, yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, the, if, if you know wolves, this, this is a, it, it's a worried wolf. It came, I was sitting in a, in a vulture watching hide in mm -hmm. Bulgaria, mm -hmm. in the Rodopi Mountains um, rewilding area. And uh, I was a paying customer with the, the, the uh, vulture watching uh, guy. Mm -hmm. He gets eagles and vultures and some foxes. And I was so upset because um, the, the vultures were all there. There were about a hundred vultures hanging around, but they didn't want to land. And I wanted them to land and to, uh, you know, to be able to take pictures. And the light was perfect. And I'm thinking, 
why don't they land? And then suddenly this guy shows up and then I understood, <laughs> ah, that's why they're not landing. <laughs> but I thought, I thought I got a better deal. I got a wolf picture rather than just a vulture picture. And next morning there were no wolves and there was no wolf, but then the vultures were down. So mm. I got them as well. But yeah. this is a worried wolf. He's I mean, he came along. Look, yeah. Yeah, he came along and I, I shot a few uh, pictures and he heard the camera hmm. shutters sound and looked up and looking, you know, what is this? Is this something I should be worried about? Hmm. And looking straight down the barrel into my camera. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, the tw his ears, are <laughs> one ear is facing one way and the other is... Yeah, I think the, the right hand ear has, has uh, it probably through a fight or through a uh -huh. genetic problem uh, it, 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 it can't raise it it, it hangs <laughs> no. like that <laughs> no. if, it, if it's a uh, how say uh, yeah <laughs> Let's, you know, what's it called uh, from fighting damage or from dna i don't know okay always feel i mean i you know i love photography and i always feel that there is some alchemy between the gaze of the photographer and what and it's it's going through the equipment but there's something that happens it, it it's it you you can sense the relationship at times in a really good photograph you know you, there's that there's that feeling and i, I used to think I, I could recognize your your pictures because i knew you and i could get a sense of you know how you relate to where you are and what you're yeah. having yeah, that, that's, that, that's interesting. Some, I've heard a number of people say so, actually. Well, I could see that with your picture. Yeah. And me, I, I don't understand because um, um, uh, I just take the pictures that I like. Yes. But probably over time, if you've seen how I like to take pictures of what kind of motifs, you will probably recognize some of them. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, when you watch animals, for example, it's, it's real life through the through the camera i mean you see it 100 mm. percent and then you choose a few brief mi micro seconds mm. to show so you shoot that maybe a thousandth of a second here and one thousandth there mm. and those moments that you choose to to select to shoot or of course uh, how the I say it, it's your choice because the next microsecond the animal looks different. It looks in another direction or has another expression. Mm -hmm. But in my case, this is how I would like to showcase this animal. Yes, it's because yes. I, I I know what they look like when they look the best, mm -hmm. and and I I like that specific gaze or mm -hmm. uh, and that's very rare. I mean, they don't look at you all the time like that. It's a fraction of a second, and then they do something else. Mm. Or they, they look up and then down. And, mm. and just when they look up, there's that, yeah, a few milliseconds. And then either you get it or you don't. Mm. But I cherish those moments when I do get it. And mm. when I feel the animal, mm. I would say, looks its best. That's the wonder of still photography, mm. that you can freeze time. Mm. Video is easier, you could say, because then it's, it, it moves. Mm all the time but yeah and still you have to choose that one moment and i i feel that you know the, the great skill of a, of a photographer is that that one moment is filled with you know whatever we want to call it it's filled with a presence it's filled with an energy so that you want to gaze at it you want to look at it you know you it draws you in and and that one moment that you've captured is then expressing something that is very very you know powerful and that, for me, is uh, the essence of nature photography. Um, Stefan, it's been wonderful to speak to you, as always. I wanted to go on and talk about China, but we're running out of time. <laughs> um, and I, I really, again, want to say how, how inspiring I find the way that you've approached your work, both as a photographer and a conservationist. It means, Thank you. means a lot. And, um, you know, when I read uh, figures such as that we've lost 68% of vertebrate populations um, around the world, of wild vertebrate populations, and, and then I, I need to be reminded by 
you know, everything that we've spoken about today, I need to be reminded of the power of the natural world and how it comes back when we engage with that in time, as long as we don't leave it too late. And so my, my hope is that whoever is listening to this will realize that it's not too late. It is not too late. You know, we're at this crucial point, but it's not too late.